The year was 1892, and in a small, tight-knit valley community where everyone knew everyone's business, a woman named Sarah was about to become the talk of the town for all the wrong reasons. Winter was fast approaching, the kind of bitter bone-chilling winter that old-timers whispered about with fear in their eyes, and every family in the valley was scrambling to preserve their autumn harvest before the snows trapped them in. You could smell the hickory smoke rising from a dozen standard smokehouses, the scent of curing ham and venison filling the crisp air. But over at Sarah's homestead, something very strange and confusing was rising from the ground. Instead of the usual low, squat wooden shed that every other family used to smoke their meat, Sarah was building something that looked entirely ridiculous to her neighbors, a tall, narrow, chimney-like structure that stretched nearly 15 feet into the air, looking more like a broken church steeple than a place to store food. The men of the village wiping grease from their hands and confident in their own proven methods would stop their wagons on the road just to point and laugh at the widow's folly shaking their heads at what they considered a waste of good lumber and precious time. They whispered that the grief of losing her husband had finally driven her mad, because everyone knew that heat was what cured meat, and a tower that tall would let all the valuable heat escape long before it ever touched the pork. Sarah ignored them, working from dawn until dusk with a quiet desperate intensity, hauling stones, and mixing mortar to seal the base of her strange creation, her hands raw and bleeding from the rough labor. She wasn't just building a smokehouse. She was building a survival machine based on a memory of a technique her grandfather had once described to her, a method from the old country that had been all but forgotten in this new land of quick fixes and hasty construction. She knew something the neighbors didn't. She knew that the coming summer would be just as dangerous as the winter, bringing a humid, rotting heat that would turn improperly cured meat into poison. And she was terrified that the standard hot-smoking method everyone else trusted would not be enough to save her children. The ridicule reached its peak when she was seen digging a long, shallow trench almost 20 feet away from the tower, burying a clay pipe that connected a small fire pit to the base of her meat tower, a design that seemed to make no sense to the conventional wisdom of the time. One neighbor, a man who prided himself on his prize-winning hams, even leaned over her fence one afternoon to offer friendly advice, telling her that she was going to starve her family because the smoke would be stone cold by the time it hit the meat, effectively doing nothing to preserve it. Sarah just wiped the sweat from her forehead, looked him in the eye, and said, He cooks, but cold smoke keeps, a phrase that would ring in his ears months later when the flies started buzzing. As the first snowflakes began to drift down from a steel-gray sky, the laughter died down, replaced by the grim silence of survival preparation, and Sarah hung her precious, hard-won sides of bacon high up in the dark, cool shaft of her tower. She lit the small fire far away in the pit watching as the smoke traveled underground cooling as it moved, until it drifted up into the tower like a ghostly white mist, bathing the meat without warming it even a single degree. The village hunkered down for the freeze, confident in their supplies, completely unaware that the real test wasn't the cold that was coming, but the rot that would follow. This is where the story gets interesting because sometimes the things that look the craziest are actually the only things that work. To understand why Sarah S. Meat Tower was a stroke of genius rather than a descent into madness, you have to understand the invisible war that is constantly being fought inside a piece of curing meat. The neighbors were using what is known as hot smoking, a method where the fire is directly inside or very close to the smokehouse, creating a temperature of around 150 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which partially cooks the meat while it smokes it. This method is fast efficient and produces a delicious product that is ready to eat in a few days which is exactly why it was so popular among the busy pioneers who had a thousand other chores to do. However, Sarah understood a critical flaw in this popular method. When you hot smoke meat, the heat renders the fat, melting the protective barrier, and changing the chemical structure of the protein in a way that makes it susceptible to spoilage if the weather turns humid and hot. Cooked fat goes rancid much faster than raw, cured fat, and while hot smoked meat is fine for a few weeks or even a couple of months in the cold, it becomes a ticking time bomb when the temperature rises above 70 degrees. Sarah S. Tower was designed to separate the two elements that everyone else thought had to go together. She wanted the smoke, but she absolutely did not want the heat. By digging that 20-foot trench and burying the pipe underground, she created a natural geothermal cooling system. As the hot smoke from her fire traveled through the cool earth, the heat was 
absorbed by the soil, leaving only the pure concentrated preserving compounds of the smoke to enter the tower. This cold smoke would wrap around the bacon and hams, hanging high in the shaft, penetrating deep into the muscle fibers over weeks, rather than days drying them out, and creating an inhospitable environment for bacteria without ever cooking the meat. It was a process that required immense patience, demanding that she tend the fire gently for weeks on end to ensure it never flared up too. Hot a lonely vigil that she kept while her neighbors slept soundly believing their work was already done. The design of the tower itself was also a masterclass in airflow dynamics, even if Sarah didn't know the scientific terms for it. The height of the structure created a natural draft or chimney effect that pulled the smoke up constantly, ensuring that stale air never settled around the food. In a standard squat smokehouse, humidity can get trapped in the corners, creating pockets where mold can fester. But in Sarah's vertical shaft, the air was always moving, always drying, and always curing. She was effectively dehydrating the meat while saturating it with antimicrobial smoke, turning her bacon into something as durable as leather and as safe as pemmican, while her neighbors were merely flavoring their meat and hoping for the best. As winter turned to spring, the difference in the methods wasn't immediately obvious, and the neighbors still chuckled when they saw her climbing a ladder to check on her magic beans up in the tower. But then came the fall spring, a period of sudden. Unexpected damp warmth that hit the valley in late March, thawing the ground and waking up the microscopic enemies that destroy food supplies. In the standard smokehouses, the fluctuating temperatures caused the rendered fat on the neighbors' hams to soften and sweat, creating a moist surface that was a perfect breeding ground for spoilage. While inside the cool, dark shaft of the meat tower, Sarah's bacon remained dry, firm, and completely unaffected. The neighbors didn't know it yet, but the clock was ticking on their food supply, and the laughter was about to turn into a very different sound. When true summer finally hit the valley, it arrived with a vengeance, bringing a suffocating blanket of humidity and temperatures that soared into the 90s for weeks on end. It was the kind of weather that turns milk sour in an hour and makes fresh meat rot before you can even get it to the pan. And it was the ultimate test for the winter's preservation efforts. By July, a strange and unpleasant smell began to waft from the storage sheds of the most critical neighbors, the sickly sweet, unmistakable stench of rancid fat and spoiling pork. Panic began to set in quietly at first, then with growing desperation. As family after family opened their smokehouses to find their precious supply of ham slick with slime and crawling with maggots, the hot-smoked meat, which had been cooked just enough to break down its cellular integrity, could not withstand the relentless heat and humidity. The fat had turned gray and the meat near the bone had begun to sour from the inside out, a condition known as bone taint. The man who had mocked Sarah over the fence was the hardest hit. His prize-winning hams were completely ruined, forcing him to bury his family's winter investment in the woods to hide the shame and the smell. Hunger is a humbling force, and as the supplies in the valley dwindled and the prospect of a lean, starving harvest season loomed, the eyes of the village turned back to the widow's folly. They watched as Sarah climbed her ladder, opened the small hatch at the top of her weather-beaten tower, and lowered a side of bacon that looked dark, hard, and unappealing to the untrained eye. It wasn't the soft pink meat they were used to. It was a deep mahogany red, firm and dry, looking almost like a piece of polished wood. But when she sliced into it, revealing the ruby red meat and the snowy white, perfectly preserved fat, the scent that drifted across the yard wasn't the smell of rot, it was the rich, savory, mouth-watering aroma of perfectly cured, hickory-smoked bacon. She fried it up in a cast-iron skillet, the fat rendering clear and golden, and the taste was unlike anything the neighbors had ever experienced, intense, salty, and utterly free of the taint of spoilage. That evening, Sarah didn't just feed her own children. She sliced up her supply and shared it with the very neighbors who had laughed at her offering them not just food but a lesson in the value of the old ways. The meat tower wasn't magic and it wasn't madness. It was a triumph of patience over convenience, a physical proof that taking the easy road often leads to a dead end. Sarah's bacon didn't just last until summer. It lasted through the summer, staying edible well into the next autumn, proving that the extra work of the cold smoke method was the best insurance policy a pioneer family could have. The laughter was gone replaced by a quiet awe and the sound of hammers ringing out across. The valley, as one by one, the neighbors began to dig trenches and build their own towers, learning the hard way that heat cooks, but cold smoke keeps. 
So the next time you see someone doing something that looks completely backwards or crazy to modern eyes, take a closer look, they might just know a secret that you've forgotten. If you enjoyed this slice of forgotten history, hit that like button and subscribe for more stories of survival ingenuity.